Hi, Manuel. Could you please tell me a little bit about yourselves and the evolution of the game Carked It? Uh, well, my name's Ewan, uh, and I'm coming to you today from Ghana country in Adelaide. Um, and I have been, I guess, working with a number of change makers in the end of life space for the last four years. Uh, we come together in a network called the Good Death Impact Network, and I am the lead convener of that network. Uh, over time, we've accumulated an innovation fund, which is a bunch of money that we can put towards things that we believe need to exist to create better death and dying outcomes in Australia. And one of the things that we wanted to invest in was an idea that Simon had for a card game, like a really fun way to open the door just enough to broach the taboo subject that is death. Maybe Simon can So, talk yeah, to I'm you Simon. I'm that. on Turrbal and Yagara land on the south banks of the Brisbane River. Um, so, I'm the co founder of an organization called The Aging Revolution. And we've been, we've been looking, we started in 2015. Um, in 2016, we did a big road trip around Australia, ran storytelling events to try to understand some of the problems about what it's like to grow older. Um, we clocked up 16,000 kilometres in a 1989 short wheelbase Pajero over five months running storytelling events. So that's a whole other story. But um, and we've always been interested in how we can improve the systems around growing older and ageing and how we can look at ageism and how we can also increase personal resilience. Um, because there's loads of talking heads in the ageing space to tell you all the problems and there's very few people actually doing something. So we joined the End of Life Network, or the Good Death Impact Network, because it was uh, really obvious that if you didn't have good conversations, that people didn't know what you want, how you wanted to live, let alone how you wanted to die. And so if you don't know how you want to live, you don't have conversations around what you want to do before you die, where do you want to visit, um, what is a good death to you in terms of where and who's there? Do you, and then we obviously worked a lot with the healthcare systems as well doing our work. So it's like... Do you have an advanced care plan? Do people know what you want? Do they know your faith? And so all these are questions that people don't talk about. And then obviously there's an inherent ageism in our society as well, where people are allergic to growing older, let alone talking about dying. So when we sort of you and posited the question, how can we improve conversations around dying and death and making sure people have good deaths? And that whole thing was pretty much exacerbated and exaggerated by COVID. The idea was you can't, go down the traditional route of serious government. Let's have you got an advanced care plan. You've got to make it fun. Like, and so there's a card game called Cards Against Humanity where you, and I think Stanford or Harvard did a study around, it actually increases empathy by talking about really difficult conversations around things like racism, sexism, gender inequality in a humorous kind of messed up way. And so we wanted to take that and then do it around dying and death and start having serious conversations in a funny way and then throw things in there that are like, what is an advanced care plan? I don't know. I'll look it up on the internet, you know, and other things like, you know, what's diaphanization? I don't know. I'll look it up. Someone's more serious than others, but it starts that conversation. And just by starting the conversation, you know that you're hoping that more actions will follow. Yeah. So that's how it all came about. And so what got you into the aging space, the death and dying space in the first place? So, um, my background's um, strategic partnerships and loyalty marketing and changing behavior. Um, okay. And then I kind of had a, a bit of an epiphany around, I don't like what I do because basically I'm convincing people to buy shit they don't even know they want yet. I'd rather help the world do something. And so I ended up running Seniors Card for the New South Wales government for about two years, yeah. looking at how we can actually improve the lives of older people. Um, and through that, I run storytelling events and... Yeah. Kind of, and that tradition was based, obviously, on the knowledge transfer and stories of the First Nations people of this, of this country. And then giving people a voice, and this is kind of like how I met Leone. So Leone was running the seniors in Queensland. And we met at a conference, had some tequila, one thing led to another, and here I am with, with her partner and stepdad, and um, started the ageing revolution. And it's like, how can we do things differently? I think it was out of mutual frustration around the negative language about ageing, the rhetoric yeah. around it, the grey tsunami, the problem with the healthcare system, ageism around employment. And as a woman, she found ageism around, you know, self-directed ageism, about 40 and 50. And like, I can't do this because I'm in my 50s. I can't do this because I'm perimenopause. 
And yeah. so we started the Aging Revolution just because we wanted to kind of shift the narrative. We didn't know what we were doing or how we wanted to do it. I was lucky enough to be sent on a benevolent society year-long course around leadership and how you look at adaptive sort of problems, wicked problems. And so we thought, let's go talk to people. Let's go talk to people about what it's like to grow older. And that's why we did the road trip. And so I think one of the things that you and I have in common and Leonie is the whole idea around co-design, design thinking, making, if you're going to make, if you're going to find solutions for people, use, yeah. include the people who have lived experience in the design yeah. of it. And that's how we kind of got into this whole area. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. You and what got you into this space? Um, so death, first of all. Um, so about 14 years ago, my brother died in an unfortunate accident <gasps> uh, just before his daughter was born. And that was obviously a really traumatic experience for uh, my family and I think, you know, I was actually in therapy straight after that to help myself get through it, but my parents never did that. And it took fully 14 years of them processing before they even, you know, wow. dealt with my brother's things and got rid of his stuff. And I think, you know, there's 14 years of their lives where they yeah. could have had a different experience if they had had the tools and the skills and the like the ability to have empathy for themselves and get the support they need um, rather than just trudging through that kind of black hole that grief can become. And uh, yeah, so for me, there was that kind of personal desire to see people not have to, of course, grief is going to be there. It's with you every day when you lose someone as close as that. But it doesn't need to be a dark cloud. Like grief can also look like the joy in remembering your loved one, the joy of knowing that their wishes were met uh, as they were dying or after they were dying, and uh, mm -hmm. knowing that you've honoured them in the ways that they wanted to be honoured. And I think uh, when I came to the Australian Centre for Social Innovation, where I work, um, we were funded by the Wicking Trust to start a network uh, to make yeah. a good death yeah. possible. We can talk a bit more about what a good death what I mean by a good death, um, and that led to yeah. meeting Simon. So what's going on in this space? Been... What's Australia like? Do we talk about death? Do we not talk about death? Do we all just pretend it's never going to happen? What's actually going on in Australia when it comes to death, dying, conversations about it? I'll just have a little go and then you can take on. So I think it, quite a lot of it depends on the culture you're from. Okay. Um, like, if you're from the Western Anglo-Saxon Protestant, like Waspy culture, hardly anybody talks about it because they're too busy trying to look young still because they're, they're allergic to growing old, let alone yeah. talking about death. And I think it's very much a taboo subject. It's like, don't talk to me about dying. Don't, and even when someone's in their 80s, well, my dad died of motor neuron disease, so he knew he was dying, and he still refused to talk about himself dying. And you're like, Why? And I think it is this trauma and this process. They just, I think we, see, we seem to be allergic to the inevitable. We try and think we try to cling on to youth. All the language around ageing is basically, you know, I think Ashton Applewhite puts it really good. It's like ageing, like ageism is a prejudice against your future self. And like death denial is yeah. almost like a prejudice against your own good end. And so, but we just don't do it. But I think other communities, you know, other immigrant communities from sort of maybe Asia or the Mediterranean region, they have much better conversations around dying and death. And I think, you know, it's, it might be how we live as well, if, if cross generations live um, much more closely together. So, my, my, so Leone, for example, comes from an Italian background. And they had, she lived with her mother and her grandmother all in a house. So death was something they talked about because you were all together. Um, and then I think obviously, First Nations people talk about death in a very different way. And then what actually that means in terms of transcendence of energies and souls and faith. And I think uh, communities do talk about it in a different way. But I think the, the modern Australia has, does have an issue talking about it. But I think a lot more seems to be happening in the space around okay. death doulas and around serious conversations. And that's why then sort of the network started, to try and connect all these dots. You and I probably, probably good point to carry on. Well, I think the only thing that I would really add to what Simon has shared is that death used to be something that happened at home, that 
that we were all around. And over time, yeah. there has been a medicalization of death, where death is now something that happens in a clinical setting um, with a healthcare professional who, in the majority of cases, has maybe only spent two hours of their entire training learning how to have conversations about death. A lot of it is actually about preserving life rather than honouring with dignity that someone is dying and it's time to let them go. And a lot of people who haven't had the chance to have meaningful conversations with their loved one about dying don't advocate for them to be left alone, to be allowed to be died. They like try and save them at every cost regardless of what quality of life might emerge on the other side of those medical interventions. And that's uh, a really sad state of affairs that might not even be. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think um, I heard a story um, from a professor uh, who did some work overseas um, and they had all these overseas doctors go to this hospital and the doctors were like wanted to show their most successful patient and they kept a person in a coma alive for 10 years. And to them, that was success. And to me, our, our version of what success means in the medical world is very different from what actually, from yeah. a personal point of view, success might mean. So I think that's sort of kind of like another issue we have, right? Like, when do you want to go and how do you want to go? Yeah. And I guess that leads into that next point of why are we, why is this so important? Like, why is it a conversation that we need to have? I think, I think choice is a big thing. So obviously there are laws changing around the country around um, voluntary assisted dying. And I think they're really important. And if, if you're going to start looking down at voluntary assisted dying, you need to start having those conversations. And I think the problem with not having conversations is choice and basically your control of your life is taken away from you. As soon as if people don't know what you want or how you want to live or how you want to die or where, as soon as you're in a medical system, you're in a system and you have no choice. You have no, you have no power about what happens to you. So I think you need to start having these conversations so you do have control of what happens before, during and after. Mm. We actually undertook some research at the start of this whole project to understand what is important to people at the end of their life. Um, and we came out with kind of eight key things. So for the person who is dying, what's important to them is that their values and what matters to them is upheld throughout their end of life journey. It's important that they are supported to live well through the dying process, uh, that they die in a place of their choosing and not unnecessarily in an institutional setting like a aged care facility or an hospital and that they're not a burden to their loved ones during that process. Those are the main concerns we heard from people who are dying. And then for their loved ones, what we heard is they didn't want to see yeah. the person suffer or be in physical and emotional pain. So comfort was important to them. They also wanted to be able to work through bereavement at their own pace um, and be supported through the journey of grief and loss and um, be acknowledged as part of the care team. Often they don't even get acknowledged. Yeah. They may, might have been caring for someone for years. So actually be acknowledged in a clinical setting as part of the care team. And then finally, just be supported physically, emotionally and financially to play a role yeah. across the journey of their loved one dying. So yeah, that, that's what a good death looks so like then to the Australians what do you that we think spoke to. We're afraid of. Why do you think we don't have these conversations? In the in the in the waspy side of things, I think fi finality, like the end, is a terrifying prospect for people. Like um, we don't like to think that our time is finite, or you know, people search for purpose. Like, why am I here? All those big philosophical questions we have, yeah. and to, to, to actually go like, well, I've had this before. So I remember I'm a I'm a qualified yoga teacher. And my very cool. first day of going to yoga class, I think I made half of the people learning cry because a lot of the people were like, why are you doing this? I went, oh, I understand our purpose and why we're here. And like, there is no purpose. There's no reason you're here. Uh, and then you're not here. Um, you, can just, you just have to do what you can whilst you're here to like basically bring joy and improve the lives of others. But once you're gone, you're gone. And I think yeah. lots of people continually 
whether they'll be of faith or not of faith, struggle with the idea that you're gone. And it's the fact that what, what you're going to miss, are you going to miss your kids growing up, your grandkids? Who's going to be upset and left and bereaved? Now, yeah. that's another reason why these conversations are important, because if you don't have the conversations, paradoxically, people will be left behind not knowing what to do and be grieving and don't understand what anything is or what you want. And so it's like we try and avoid the conversations because we want to... Forget, ignore it's happening by but by ignoring it's happening and not having the conversations you actually the fears that you probably have around what will happen when you go will actually happen yeah yeah a very wise friend of mine um, once told me that it's not just the fear of death that stops us doing these things it's actually the fear of not living so, you know, I ha yeah. am I actually doing the things in my life that I want to be doing? Am I actually living in the way that I want to be within this world? And that can be really confronting. So it's actually the duality of like, yes, I'm scared of dying. But the reason I'm scared of that is I might not have done any of the stuff. That have I you mean, yeah, just come absolutely. up with a key metric of the game, measuring the game, you and I just thought... If people, the divorce rate of people Maybe playing the game goes up, wish. they suddenly realise they don't want to be with that person. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, it's, it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense because then you go, well, hang on, I can't procrastinate anymore. I can't put that off. If I'm going to do something, I need to do it now. I need to get brave. I need to get self-reflective as opposed to going, no, 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 I'll do that later. But I think, I think that's the other thing about death. So as part of this making this game, I talk to lots of people um, who are death doulas, people in palliative care, people who have lost someone, carers. I've done a lot of work with carers yeah. as part of our Aging Revolution work. One of the most amazing places I went um, was a palliative care hospital in Brisbane for children. Wow. Um, it's called Hummingbird House, and it's in North yeah, Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and it's basically where kids go who are terminal, who are like, you know, you're going to... So it's a very challenging place to be when you're talking to a nine-year-old and they're fully aware they're going to be dead within a year. Wow. And then you have to talk to the parents about that nine-year-old. And, and so this is part of some of the how we design the game was about how do you have these difficult conversations? And I think people also think death is an old thing. Mm. So pe when we first started designing this game, they're like, oh, you've got to go to aged care facilities. You've got to talk to old people about death. It's like young people die too. People our age die all the time. On the, one of the questions we asked when we did our road trip around the ageing revolution is like, what do, you think, what do you think is good about ageing? And then one of the women said, ageing. Because my husband died last year and he was 29. And so ageing is a privilege. And obviously medical science has made us 83, 82. So this whole idea that death is also the domain of the old yeah. is also something yeah. we need to talk about. Because it's like, well, what happens if someone gets, a, gets an illness or... Or, and is there is, a different... taken from us to, you know, in, a, in an awful accident? Yeah, exactly. my, brother was 20, my brother was 27, you know, um, and I think it's that death is inevitable. It's literally the only thing that every human on this planet has in common, and yet we wait to discuss it. We wait, we think it's something that's going to be in a far off distant time, like it could happen tomorrow, if we actually talk about death today, yeah. then we're going to have a better life regardless. I think it's, that's what it is, the key to life. Yeah, to absolutely. And sort of, I guess, realising that it is a gift, realising that ageing is a gift. Is there a different way that children talk about it to older folks? Yeah, actually, their way, so it's really interesting. So we, so we did like five or six prototypes of the game and people played them with families and children. And I was talking to other mothers and fathers of kids and also the children themselves. And um, we were like, is this, and they, we really put our adult lens on this where it's like, oh, it's a taboo subject. Can children handle it? Talking about death. They handle it way easier than we do. Way easier because um, they haven't had all these years to like conceptualize or process or they just yeah. like, and so I don't know whether it's because the concept, the concept of death is different. But they, you know, yeah. so they, so the card, the games in the card, would you rather game? Which, would you rather be trampled to death by camels or eaten by a killer whale? That's all influenced by children who just, kept, who when we started playing the game, they're like, would you rather be mauled to death <laughs> by a gorilla or eaten by a shark? I'm like, I don't know. Okay, I'll think about that one. And then they go, why? And then you go like, 
oh, pain, I don't want to be in pain, okay? And so kids talk about it fine. Yeah. Because, again, and I think this is when one of the things that came out through is like having pets or having grandmothers. Kids yeah, are exposed yeah. to death too. Um, yeah. And so it's safe. As long as it's a safe space to have these conversations with children, they're fine with it. More yeah. Probably more fine than adults. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess that's that's then that connection potentially that you've made of making the game fun. Like, why is that the the yeah. angle that you've taken? Because it's amazing. Like, we'll we'll talk. We'll show you the game in a second. But well, who who wants to play a game that's not fun? <laughs> I think that's like the, the whole point of a game is that you have fun when you're playing it. And I guess the thing that I love about it is I played it with all my colleagues at work. I played it. I went on a like boys weekend away and we played it and we had the funnest like sit around with drinks, playing like how you're gonna die, giving each other Aww. each other's eulogies, like yeah. literally crying with laughter. And and what I love about this game though is you play the fun cards, but in your hands okay. you've got a bunch of Serious ones intermingled in there, so there's this real, like, beautiful passive education yeah. that happens while you're having fun. But it it will make you cry, cry with like. Was there joy. any hesitation in laughter, in matching so, up sort yeah, of fun, yeah. joy, laughter, and conversations about death? Was there any? No, it was it was pro that's why we did it because we we're like, how can we have conversations? How can how do you start a difficult conversation? You start it by making it easy and how do you make something easy you, yeah. like, well, if you have to make it what some of these people want to do and people want to talk about themselves people like being ridiculous being absurd having fun yeah and basically just give people permission to do that yeah what's some of the feedback you've had so far it's all been really good so people use it in different ways so some people follow the rules other people just make rules up as they go along and so a friend of mine played it with 15 of his mates I'd have to divide people up into teams, and they all had five this and this. And they just use it to craft stories about what they wanted in life. And I think so it actually becomes, that's what, what, as Ewan suggested, like, am I doing what I want to do? Maybe I don't. Maybe I do want to go to a desert island and be there for a week. I should probably do that. Or actually, I want to drive a car really fast or swim with a dolphin. And yeah. so all the, all the feedback we've had has been, it's been amazing. It's been really, really positive. Um. So... Because this um, was only launched at the end of last year with your Kickstarter, wasn't it? Oh, not yeah, not even. It was probably yeah, about November it was launched. Um, yeah. And then uh, it's out there. So the website's live now, but we haven't had the next like we're waiting for um, sort of June, July to give it another big push. It's kind of exhausting. It took two years from concept to launch, and so it was when it, once it gets launched, I think I'd run out of energy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a very, very <laughs> intricate, beautifully designed, um, well thought out game. Um, so, if I have a look very quickly, we've got three piles of cards. We've got a card, a pile of cards, a green pile of cards called Live. And in looking at them, they are how you want to live, but more specifically, things that you have done and that you want to done is want to done or want to do is that right so the idea is um yeah it's like before you die what do you want to do to yep. what do you want to do in life what do you want to do to prepare for your death what do you want to do to make sure that once you're dead the people who are left behind are treated or get what you want yep. so you know I, I i was with a um a father and two daughters and then we they were like One's, I think one's about who gets what, who gets all the stuff. And, um, and one of the daughters, well, surely I get, I get your car. And he was like, do you? Um, and they're like, what do you mean I don't get your car? You said I could get your car. <laughs> so so, so it, start, it starts these conversations. Yeah. Um, so the whole point is to do that. Um, and then yeah. also it kind of plays along the lines of who knows who the best, right? Okay. So if, if are you a materialistic person or are you like nature or are you just a bit crazy messed up and want to do something weird? Um, yeah. So the idea is to have, have these start those discussions about before you die, what do you want to do and how, where, how do you want to go? Yeah. And I guess that also, as much as it, it honours the, the dying person or the person who's died, their wishes, it also potentially can reduce that conflict between siblings and between family members because it's all out in the open because those 
conflicts can be ugly. Oh, yeah, for sure. And expensive. Yeah, because someone, someone, exactly, and I know that um, <laughs> we were talking, we played it with my mother-in-law, and she said, well, obviously, Mavis is going to get the, uh, the statue of, and I'm like, is that written down anywhere? Why is that obvious? Well, I, I said to her, I'm, yeah, but I don't know you said that to her. And t if you're dead, I've just got her word for it. And then what if three people said they said that to you? What do I do about that then? So, it, as, as you alluded to, within those cards, there are things like, do a will. So there is no argument yeah. with your family. And you might yeah. not play it, but it's there. Um, there's another one, Advanced Care Plan, which is probably a card that no one will ever play around... <laughs> Unless you're playing with someone who might be a doctor, and they'd appreciate it. But it's, um, we've had people play and then ask, what is an advanced care plan? And, I'm, and mm -hmm. then they look it up. And so then they find out what one is, because beforehand they might not have known. And so I know the government and, you know, health organisations are always trying to get people to fill out their advanced care plan and get a will. But um, this just educates people about what it is. Yeah. So some of the live cards, if I go random, let me see. We've got a live card. Shark hugging. What extreme thing would you want to do before you die? Shark hugging. So that's um, that's a very personal card to me because that's actually me in the image hugging the shark. If you look, so my hair's long. And, it um, is. And I do I used to, I do lots of free diving, and if you notice, the dolphins are actually holding um, weapons. Weapons. Because I also think not all dolphins are nice like people, and you're going to get evil dolphins. And I reckon some sharks, some sharks get the blame for murdering when it's actually Frank, the um, messed up, traumatised dolphin. Well, there's research to show that <laughs> dolphins are dicks. So, um... <laughs> all right, next okay. one. Dish out valuables, collect everything in a pile and hand it out like hotcakes. What would you give away? Ooh, because they say you don't... What's that song? <laughs> um, you've never seen a hearse with a trailer hitch? Like, you're not taking it with you. It's got to yeah. go... Somewhere. I, I think that was the one. card where, he's, where um, the, the daughter said, oh, you can't, right? And um, then, he start, then he start, started the conversation about who gets what. I want your stuff. How about that brooch? I want Grandma's brooch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Donate. Oh, donate body to science. Save your family the cost of a funeral at ben and benefit science at the same time. Why would they want your body? Oh. oh. <laughs> That's the, you, you've hit on something that I love about the game. So you've got yep. the, the statement on the cards. So, you know, for example, The Last Supper, you organize an amazing last yep. meal with all the things you love to eat and drink. Yep. So that might be something that you want to plan for and that you want to have before you go. And then there's conversation start yeah. on each card. Well, not on every card, but uh, as you're going through it, and I love the one, like, what would you eat, where, and with yeah. who? You could end up talking about that for an hour. Uh, there's so much depth to this game. Yeah. You literally can just play it as it is at a very surface level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we used to movie. literally have that conversation about donating your body to science because I've got an applied science degree. I've done anatomy with actual people who've donated their body to science. And the question then is, well, I want it to yeah. go to science and I want that, but I've seen what first year students do. Um <laughs> Like, is that really the best use of my body? Um, yeah, so that's a that's a question that would get some some debate. Um, so then, oh, and then we've got swimming with dolphins, unless they're dicks, and then we don't want to swim. No, with no, dolphins. no, no, no. And they're armed. Um, the <laughs> the title of this podcast. Dolphins are dicks. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Dolphins are dicks. Um, so then the next pile of cards says die. That's where I'm going next, isn't it? It's the die card. Yeah. Um, and if I'm understanding correctly, people are... Is this the one where people are convincing you or it's the live one where people are convincing you? So the you? first card you get is the die card. So basically um, everybody gets one at random. Um, unless yep. you're playing with children and then they will want to go through the entire deck and pick how they die because that's what's happened and it's like, that's fine too, do that. Um, but um, there's three kinds of dying card. One is basically just a how you die. Like you, I think you looked at the one about ripped yeah. apart by Dalmatians. Yep. Um, the other ones have a diagonal line, and that was inspired by my friend's yep. seven-year-old daughter. And so this one here, tickled to death or bitten to death by sexy vampires. So, yeah, 
old, <laughs> old and with regrets, or young and with no regrets. So then you've got to choose one, and then you've got to explain to people why you chose that one. So that in itself becomes a conversation starter around how you want to die. Like, is it, is it yeah. with quickly or slowly or with pain or with time to think about it? And then you have the cards that have a question mark, um, and they're basically the ones that say, um, th what's the grossest way to die you can think of? What's the worst way you can die to think of? So, you know, yes. the worst way of die you can think of for a kid, or pick a bizarre, pick a way, bizarre to die. way to die. So that could be yeah. like, drown to death in a cesspool of elephant dung. I don't know, it's made it up. <laughs> but um, so kids will always pick something. Pick the best way. Yes, pick, pick the best, the way, best to way to die. So that yeah. could be like, you know, parachute didn't open, sudden or just oh. surrounded by my whole family <laughs> with no pain and, and in my sleep. Yeah. And so, again, they, they can all start conversations around what's a good death for you or what's a bad death. And so they're the Absolutely. three death cards. And so they normally get dished out at random, and it can impact your choices. So some people play yeah. it really strategically. They'll be like, well, I died like this, therefore before I did, died like this, I was probably doing this or I was doing these things or I want to do that. And other yeah. people don't play it strategically. They just go, like, I want to do that. Um, and then you can actually, and then some people create a whole story about their whole life, about what they did before they died and how they died and why they died yeah. in a stupid way. Yeah. Darwin Award yeah. way. Pick a stupid, my favorite, well, one of my favorite board games that I have is Stupid Death. Um, you know, from Horrible Histories. Yeah, yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> yeah. There is one, one die card, which I think is incredibly powerful i think it's perhaps yep. one of the most beautiful illustrations but it is it's a serious yeah. one i'm just gonna put it on the mm. camera for you to see but it's oh. i died alone in a care home i think that image yeah. is absolutely stunning um and it is just one of those things where it really makes you yeah. think god does anyone want that is that really what anyone wants and yet that is like essentially the focus of our attention within this country is on aged care facilities but actually it's only like i think it's less than 20 percent of australians will actually die eight percent yeah and yet that's the focus of like all the big debates nationally is aged care when actually most people are never going to die they, yeah. a, they can't afford it either you know maybe they're young when they die and, and so yeah, it's, because it's, the, the image is a universal country. noise if anyone gets that card and it's yeah. Oh, everyone yeah. makes that noise if they get that card. They're like, oh, it's like it's just like their hearts sink. Yeah, because it's this beautiful image of a skeleton in a wheelchair just looking out of a window by so, themselves. I would like to actually say, so I'm wearing I'm wearing one of the how you dies. This is because I almost kill people in my house on a regular basis when I make chili sauce. So I seem right, to be immune so to it now, but everyone else co coughs up their lungs, and I. So you've got a skeleton died, drowning in a vat. Of, yeah, and it's actually. Of chilli sauce. Yeah. And then so it's, I'd like, so Mickey Brogan um, is a local Brisbane artist. She did all the art for every card. <gasps> so every wow. card is hand-drawn by her. Um, wow. And, no wonder it took you two years. This yeah, is amazing. And the reason we chose a skeleton is um, because it's gender neutral and not race yeah. specific. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of like goes across um all yeah. spectrums of people so we've had people going oh can we convert it into a different language can i use it can i can i make the we had um an indigenous woman saying can i a girl say can i make a want a version for sort of my indigenous crew and we're like that'd be amazing so it, it's it's quite it's we, i think we're just at the beginning of what it could become so we'll see that see where yeah going. so why do you think that that ugh, noise comes up when we talk about that card I think it's just that it really comes down to, remember I said a good death, I die in a place of my choosing, I do not unnecessarily yeah. die in an institutional setting. Like, I think, if you think about it, like, what does in your head imagine where you die and how you die, most people would say in my sleep, at home, in my bed, like, it's like the, you know, it's pain free, there's no suffering, you're in a place that, it, you know, it represents who you are. If you're in a care room, it's being designed by someone who doesn't know you, you're not surrounded by or friends things. or family, you're, you know, being looked after by 
by people who are paid to be there, not by the people who yeah. want to be there necessarily. And I mean, I shouldn't say that there are oh, amazing because we people working in these like absolutely amazing. I worked in one that was actually my when I was sixteen. My first job was in an aged care facility, and um, so I know that there are salt of the earth phenomenal carers uh, in these places. But I also saw at the same time um, older yeah. people who didn't want to be there, who felt very lonely, yeah. who saw their family once a fortnight, and if that, who hadn't been outside in a year. That was one of the people who I saw, like, who I had to, I was like, can I grab a wheelchair and take this person outside? They've not been outside for a year. And uh, they were like, yeah, of course you can. Yeah. So there was nothing to stop me doing that. But there just yeah. was no capacity within that yeah. setting yeah. for that to be something. I think this could be, you know, there's a much bigger argument and conversation to be had around care and aged care. And I think, you know, carers and people who work in aged care facilities are massively undervalued. They don't get paid enough. Hugely. Um, they're always trying to, you know, I think the model mm. of how we do these things in terms of a for profit model, so you're cutting costs and cutting resources, I think. Is a whole yeah. big conversation. There's some great yeah. places. I've worked with some great aged care facilities. So we, we actually took virtual reality into an aged care facility so people could swim with dolphins um, if they wanted to. Um, so yeah. there are some really forward thinking places. But I think it's just yeah. the idea of being alone, not being surrounded by people or things and the joys that you want. Yeah. Yeah. Our, uh, the last episode, I believe, of the Empathy podcast was Empathy and Aged Care. And it was all about relationship centered care. And oh, Beautiful, beautiful. So the last pile of cards is the buy cards. Do you want to tell me about that? Buy girl back. Buy girl back. <laughs> basically, um, so you yeah, came up with the whole live, die, buy vibes. So that was good. And it's basically, um, you're gone, you're dead. Um, what Now what? What do you want to happen? Um, and so it could be, uh, how do you want your funeral to be? Um, what do you want your family to do? Do you want to have a big statue erected about you and saying you're awesome? Do you want to be embalmed? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Snap. Embalmed, New Orleans style. So you've taken some interesting things from other different cultures. Oh, basically... Have your skull dipped in molten gold. Exactly. Oh, I love so... it. And then there's the eulogy card as well. So the wild card eulogy. Save this card until the end for a chance for, chance for bonus points. Bonus mini game. Go around the table and give every player a eulogy. Oh. So oh. people use that in different ways. <laughs> so the idea of that one, if someone has a eulogy card, they can play, they can get two people to give their eulogy and they have to pick the best one. So you have to know the person oh. really well. And I think Ewan had a lot of fun with this one with his friends by the sound of it. Um, but as soon as you start giving eulogies for one person, mm -hmm. everybody goes like, do mine. <laughs> so it normally, yeah. turns, it normally turns into a... Uh, and it's also at the end of the game, so you might have had four or five bottles of wine by then. Um, yep. So, I love you guys. Yeah, and so, or, you know, the opposite. No one liked him. <laughs> Don't even know, you know, just, <laughs> I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, it, it, again, it was, and then it's quite, I think it's, um, there's it an idea that kind of like came from, I did, it's part of the leadership course. You have to go around the table and you have to say nice things about people. Yeah. And it's amazing at how difficult it is for someone to sit there and hear people be nice about them. It can make people mm. feel really uncomfortable. And I wanted, I think discomfort's okay. That's the other thing this game was designed to do, was make people feel uncomfortable. Because change only happens when you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, and um, you can either, someone might say, oh, he's, you know, great, he's great at this and he's given love. And so people might actually stop being, talk about all the things you've done and why they love you. And that in itself yeah. can be quite an amazing experience and quite difficult for some people to hear yeah so that's why that was there and then I've, i mean i've been to funerals where i sit there listening going geez i hope they knew that when they were alive like we wait till the very end till they're gone for all these people to say all these beautiful things and i go geez i hope they knew that one of the members of our network um, in Western Australia for her 60th birthday and um, had a living wake. So everyone rocked up thinking they were coming to a party. And uh, yeah, this she was like, I want to know what people would say. Like, and I want them to, I'm going to get them to yeah. sign this like tablecloth that I have. And yeah. that's actually going to be her death shroud. Like, um, and I just think 
what beautiful kind of, I guess, how powerful it is to yeah. hear those things before you die so that you can go on with your life knowing who you are and how you're valued oh, by your love. Amazing. So, so if we look idea. at this game as sort of the catalyst for change, what do you want people to know with or without the game? What do you want people to know and do and how do you want the, I guess that, waspy culture that you said how do you want that to change what do you want to see happen because of this conversation lots of things things, um, but i would say that the main ones are that we can open ourselves up to death as being a reality within our lives i think as soon as we can you know be real with each other. We can have different conversations. And I would love to see people planning for what they want and then living like they are going to die because we are, we all are. And and I think it can be incredibly liberating. I would love to see more people opting to die at home and making provisions throughout their life that enable that to happen. I think there's two. Yeah, uh, there's a number of things. There's two areas. One is obviously having these conversations, and so people know, so loved ones know what you want. But then also, it's um, the practical side of it as well. Is um, start creating, uh, getting a will, and doing advanced care plan, and telling loved ones. Because I think one of you know, when someone dies, the amount of stuff you have to go through. You're grieving already, and they're like. Bank balances, social net, social media accounts, passwords to Netflix. Where's my car park? Are there mm. spare keys? What happens to the pets? There's millions of practical things as well. So it is the emotional, conversational. Let's go on that holiday now while we can, because I, I want to go to the Caribbean and to around there. But there's also the uh, getting stuff sorted. So everyone, so your loved ones or your daughter or whoever it is knows where stuff is and you've got it ready. Um, so it's not, you know, because everyone goes, I'll do it next year. I'll do it when I'm ill. I'll do it. And then, they yeah. don't, and then you don't. Yeah, absolutely. It made me, absolutely. it made me do a will just my, starting to make this game. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Gentlemen, ooh, I just bumped the microphone. Um, gentlemen, I just want to say thank you so much for this conversation today. If people do want to find you, if they want to buy the game, where can they where can they reach out? So <clears throat> there's a website. It's carkedit.com, C-A-R-K-E-D-I-T.com. Um, you can go buy the game on there. It's got a T-shirt and stuff. And I think there's also links to um, the Good Death Impact Network um, yep. because we're really lucky. So I actually would like to do a shout-out to, to the network. So there's lots of people who are part of the network across the whole dying industry or sort of like and they've really, they've, you know, they tested it. They've given us ideas. They've helped um, design it. Um, and they're also sort of like really involved, much more than I am, actually, in the process of dying or being a death doula or being a funeral director. And they offer support and resources around dying and death. And so on, on the game, there's a QR code. On our website, there's a link to that network. Um, so you can, you can have access to all these resources. So if you've got any questions about any of this, um, you can actually go and find probably resources or people who can help answer it. Yeah. And the, the QR code is next to a picture of a snail with a knife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's a slow, yeah. that card was um, a slow death. <laughs> a slow... <laughs> that's a very slow death. But, yeah, within the instructions, there's also um, need support, so there's some helplines as well as information on the Good Death Impact Network. Um, gentlemen... Thank you so much for today. I genuinely appreciate your time, especially you, you and on your birthday. Thank you so much. Pleasure. It's been fun.